Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, today we want to present uh, Reckless to Fearless, the power of automated remediation uh, in partnership with Tynes. I'm, I'm Ryan Henrik, I'm with Lacework. Um, we wanted to, to start with at least a, a, a brief set of introductions. So I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Thomas here to, to introduce himself first. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I'm Thomas. I'm one of the founders of Tynes. Uh, background of about 10 years working in information security and started Tynes together with uh, our CEO Owen about three and a half years ago, basically to build a security automation product that we wished we had when we were working in information security. Right now, uh, managing the customer success team in Tynes uh, and a whole lot of other stuff, but really excited about this uh, to talk you through, I suppose, how Tynes and Lacework work, work really nicely together. Awesome. And, and I'm Ryan Henrik. I'm on the Lacework side of the, the fence here today. Um, I spent the last three years or so at Lacework starting out as a, a sales engineer, and then I built the sales engineering team for the west half of the country before um, switching into a, a technology alliances role where you know I, I got to see a lot of the other technolo uh, exciting technologies in this space and, and kind of pick and choose who, who we partner and go to market with and kind of you know, who our customers can can get the most value out of. And so, you know, that that led obviously uh, Thomas here and I had a meeting and, and we're really excited on the Lacework side about, you know, all the things that, that our customers can go and do with Tynes uh, to take action on, on the events that Lacework creates. Cool. We're up to 40 people, so I think we're going to we'll, we'll formally kick it off at this point. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, you know, part of uh, when I was saying, you know, we got really excited about what what you could do with times to automate the, the second half of kind of the the investigation flow and remediation potentially, you know, it, it all starts with the detection. And so, you know, what, what we've seen here is, you know, our customers have invested in us because of our ability to automate detections. And so, you know, what Lacework has really gone and built here is a machine that, that ingests data from your cloud, it ingests data from your configurations, your, your instances, your containers, uh, your repositories, it ingests all of that into its SaaS backend where it goes um, and it processes all that data, it correlates it, it learns what's normal in your environment. And so then it's able to help you detect things that are new or different or novel in some way with security context. And so what we've really gone and built here is, a, it, uh, is an automated detection engine. And for the last few years, our customers have been getting that in their hands. They've been deploying it at scale to their environments, you know, massive environments. Um, and and the average customer in 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 our uh, across our entire customer base receives about 1.4 alerts per day from Lacework. And so, you know, that's a major paradigm shift from the the traditional kind of security based tooling that the industry has has seen in the past. That's based on you know rules or policies or threat feeds. Um, and that's awesome. But what we saw was that, you know, our customers wanted to go and do more with the data and they wanted to go and correlate the Lacework events with maybe AWS native data or, or maybe with other data inside of Lacework. And they wanted to hand all that stuff to, um, you know, the team that would be doing the investigation or maybe the team responsible for the infrastructure. And so that's really kind of why we've kind of picked and cho chosen, you know, who we're going to go partner with so carefully. And it's why Tynes has been such an exciting partner for us. Um, and just, you know, by the numbers here, you know, Lacework, this, this is out of date every day, but, you know, we, we're tracking over 12 trillion uh, processes, users, network connections, and then we're correlating all of those things into what we call behaviors. So this is, you know, we're taking processes, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're attributing the network connections associated with them, and we're stringing those process and network connections end to end across infrastructures, um, which allow us to save, you know, millions and millions of false alarms for our customers where, you know, uh, this thing may have looked new or novel in some way because it spoke to a new IP address, but it was the same application serve to finish that it always has been in the past. So that's not something that we're going to alert on. And so, as I said before, you know, our, our average alert for our customer base is 1.4 alerts per day. Um, and, and, you know, we really want to be able to hand this over to our customers in a way that they can powerfully take action on it. And that's really what, what Tynes is all about here. Yeah, so th thanks, Ryan. So uh, Tynes is that automation platform that's able to take action based on those alerts. Um, so Tynes, as a technology, we're completely agnostic as to the tools that we integrate with. So we actually don't rely on any pre-built integrations. Our customers automate their own repetitive manual workflows in a really light, nice, like no code builder that we'll be demoing in a couple of minutes. And um, so what we do though, is we're, we're able to take alerts from a whole lot of different sources, enrich them as Ryan said, against a few different other tools and then take action. And that could be like, based on the recommendation of Lacework, making a book at private or changing, uh, take, taking a device offline or something like that. 
What we find our customers do though is they don't just like uh, yeah, receive cloud security alerts. It could be everything from phishing, endpoint alerts, SIM alerts, vol management, ticket enrichment, incident recording. Basically, wherever the security team are spending the most time, that's kind of where Tynes comes in. But the reason we really like Lacework is that, yeah, the alerts are very good fidelity. They come with solid recommendations. There's a really good API and they're a nice team to work with. Uh, so it's kind of a nice, uh, a nice partnership. Fabulous. And the thing that got me really excited when, when we went out to the market and we spoke to a lot of, uh, of different companies that do automation, but the thing that got me really excited about, about Tynes and the team over at Tynes in particular is, is not just their ability to go and automate and, 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 and do attribution, but, but how simple they've made it. So we're going to go walk through a few examples, and I don't want this to be kind of a slideware presentation, right? Uh, Thomas and I have, have spent some time building some, some, some elegant examples to show you what this technology can do. But what was really exciting to me is you know, before my career in, in, in on the vendor side of things, I was in security consulting and, um, uh, you know, working in a managed SOC and all that stuff. And, and I uh, have never been the guy that you would go to to build a, a, a Lambda function to go and, and automate remediation. I'm not a code. Uh, I'm not a code guru. I don't I'm not really good at that. And so it was really excited that, you know, a, a, a ham fisted ape like me could get times working and actually go and build things on top of uh, the data from Lacework. And so that to me was really exciting. Um, and that's, this allows our customers to go and, and actually do this at scale. It's putting the power back in the hands of the people that are actually receiving the alerts. Um, and that to me is super exciting. Great. This next thing that we wanted. So this is one of the examples that we've gone and built here. Now, I, I promise the slide is almost over. I'm going to kick this over to TK to actually uh, walk you guys through the Times UI and, and, and show you all the, the, the integration that's been built and, and kind of how this works. But um, the, really, the goal here is that Times allows us to, to automate you know, any alert from Lacework. Go and do whatever you want with it. So maybe it's taking action and solving that alert. Maybe it's just forwarding that alert to the right group of people with, um, you know, maybe the ability to automatically create a Jira ticket behind the scenes and log everything that they do. Or, you know, um, this allows us to to take the human element out of alert forwarding and, and data correlation and and just do this automatically and stop wasting all the cycles that it takes to kind of go and pull all this data together. Um, uh, you know, uh, add comments to your Jira tickets, all of that stuff. Um, and so that's what's kind of really exciting about this. Anything you wanted to add, Thomas, or um, do you want me to, to kick the screen share over to you? Yeah, I can I can take over. Fantastic. Um, let me get this up. Give me two seconds. Okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen. You're good. Brilliant. So what I, I'll, I'll show you, we'll show you a little bit of lace work in a second, but what we wanted to show you here just is like Tynes, I suppose. This is Tynes, this is the storyboard. This is where alerts are received, uh, events are generated, where you can create tickets, where you can deduplicate, where you can you know, contact, contact users, all that sort of stuff takes place in Tynes. It takes place on this, the storyboard. It's a really simple drag and drop builder. Here you go, just drag, drop, configure, connect, and you're able to go. That's like a real quick introduction to Tynes. Uh, over here, there's these seven types of actions. I'll talk about some of them later. But what we want to do is we want to show, I suppose, an alert coming in from uh, coming in from Lacework and what Tynes can do with it. This is a little more of a show and tell than uh, a, I suppose, an, uh, a together building. So what this story does, just to, to, to look at it, what we're going to do is we're going to receive an alert, a compliance violation uh, from Lacework. So Lacework generates quite a few compliance violations. If you're uh, like managing your your instance, it'll like there'll be quite a few, but sometimes they can be quite there. There can be a few of them. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to enrich that a little bit. We're going to create a message in Slack, uh, and then we're going to take some actions. And um, good examples of compliance violations are yeah, like so something that like the the the, the policy should be that every single S3 bucket does not grant allow permissions to everyone or that you don't allow, you know, uh, the entire world hit your port 22. Uh, a security group should only allow HTTP traffic or, you know, your uh, keys are rotated like, pretty frequently, things like that. So what we'll do is we'll, this is an alert that was actually generated a couple of days ago in Laceworks environment. Um, that's why we chose it. So I'm just going to run it here. Uh, this would come in, I suppose, on the air. But what we can see is when an alert is generated from Lacework, it's going to be received in here. This is a webhook agent in Tynes. So a webhook is an action that just sits here on the like storyboard. It's got a unique URL here, and it basically just waits and receives events from any particular source. In this case, Lacework has forwarded us a really nice alert uh, or a really nice event, and we can like we can take a look at it. Here we go. 
So you can see this is the event, times is received. Uh, the event title is new violations. I've got a link to the event, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, the event source is compliance, so it is a compliance violation. The event description is AWS account 95, et cetera, the Lacework customer demo account. Uh, basically, this is the compliance policy. Ensure that the attached S3 bucket policy does not grant allow permissions to everyone. So basically what's happened is somebody has allowed, like changed an S3 bucket and made the permissions allowed to everybody. So anybody can access this, anybody can like place objects and things like that. That's bad. That's not something we should do. So we want to investigate this a little bit more. What I'm going to show you here, though, is I'm going to show you this event in Lacework just so we can see it. You wouldn't spend your time in Tines, by the way. We expect you to spend your time outside of Tines. So this is not how you would investigate. I just want to show you what this event looks like. Um, here you go. So this is the event. The severity is quite high. Uh, you can see a little bit more information. So here's the like that additional information that you actually might want, that additional context. So you can see this is the these are the S3 buckets. The first bucket is like Andreas bucket for testing too. Uh, you can see the time. You can see there's some other related alerts, etc. So as I said, in times you're you're building everywhere here on the storyboard. The very first thing we want to do when we get an alert like this is we probably want to enrich that and get some more information. And in this case, the Lacework API has really good information. So all of this information that the Lacework UI has the Lacework API is able to have as well. So what we've done is we've used this HTTP request action here. This is their second action here. Just to hit the Lacework API, I'll expand this a little bit. And what we're doing is we're just like hitting the Lacework domain. We're getting event details for the event ID at the path, receive Lacework events.body.event ID. And when we look at that event, what we'll see is some cool information. So we can see the start time, the end time, et cetera. We also have this entity map, which will tell us the violation region. So extra permissions were granted. Uh, we've got the resource. So this is the actual bucket uh, that, was, uh, that was made public. Uh, you've got, there's actually three buckets, which is cool. Uh, and then you've got this recommendation ID and the recommendation ID is telling us, hey, what, what do we wanna do about this? So in times, like the, the natural next step I was kind of Ryan talked about was like, you might want to just ask some people, hey, was this delivered? This isn't the worst alert in the world. It's high severity, but yeah, you might want to ask some people like, hey, was this uh, was this good? And then take some action. So actually, Ryan, you're definitely going to be the expert. But like, who, like who, who might you ask and what might you uh, what might you ask them? Yeah. So look, look, if we're receiving this alert, the first thing, you know, on the security team, the first thing that we want to go and do is, is, is see who actually went and deployed this potentially. So, so maybe we want to go and grab the role that actually uh produce this bucket or change the permission on it and go ask the team you know first off like hey did you guys mean to do this is this supposed to, you know is this hosting a website something like that right is this supposed to be public um now i can't think of any reason uh why we would want the entire permission set to be public including you know the ability to go and, and, and change the 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 permissions on the bucket um, but perhaps there's a, a use case that i haven't thought of and, and so we want to start by asking the team now assuming that they go Oh yeah, yeah. We didn't mean to make that public. Um, you know, what do we want to do with it? We we either want to um, change the permission set on it, uh, or or add some tags to explain, sorry, why we did intend to make it public. And so those are kind of the two. Uh, you know, what I would think of is the workflow where you know I receive this alert, I'm going to go ask the team, and then I'm going to go do one of two things to it. Well, I don't need to go and do all of that. Uh, that's kind of you know the beauty of uh, of times. Perfect. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, so we don't necessarily know uh, who has done what, but we do know that the engineering team are going to be responsible. So what we're going to do is we're going to contact the engineering team on Slack. In times, we use Slack, so we're just going to contact our engineering team. The first thing I've done, by the way, is I've just extracted the S3 bucket from that resource just so I can like, add a little bit more context. Nothing too complicated. And then I've sent a message to Slack. Here, all I'm doing is hitting the Slack API. I'm hitting the channel engineering team, and then I'm asking a couple of questions. This looks a little bit complicated. It actually really is, and it's just the Slack block kit builder. And if you go over here, Slack rich text notification, drag that on over here, you'll actually have a, a, the exact example that I've given here. Um, and that's how, like, how you build. But here what I'm doing is I'm just going to post a message to Slack, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions. So I've got like the alert details and things like that. So this message has now come in and I can see new violations, like 91368. I've got the description. I've got the event type. I've got the event source. I've got my resource. I've got my bucket and I've got the recommendation. And now based on Ryan's suggestions, I've added two different options 
like this is fine, add public tags or make bucket private. Based on Ryan's actual recommendation saying like, hey, this is pretty bad. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this bucket private. But before I do that, I'll just show you here uh, that the flow. So what I've done is I've added what's called a prompt in times. It's actually really simple. Basically, you just have a URL here, prompt private. Uh, just enter that. That'll create a link that when you click it, it'll kick off this action in times and then make the bucket private. To make the bucket private, what you can see is I'm actually just hitting, so I've, that S3 bucket that I've extracted out, I'm hitting the uh, AWS or the S3 API with public access block with a put request, and that bucket's going to be made private. So I'm just going to go here, make this bucket private. This is triggered, and the bucket has, I hope anyway, let's just take a look, been made private. Okay, so it's a 200 body null. So we can actually maybe check. Do you want to Do you want to check? And I can like switch it on and off using times. Yep. So if you want to stop sharing your screen for a second, we'll, uh, I'll go ahead and pull this bucket off up. So if we look, uh, the last state that it was in is, um, it is, uh, block all public access is off. So it is, it is public right now. And if I refresh that and go back to permissions, we should be able to see that that permission set has changed. So Thomas, if you can go and, and flip it the other way around, uh, to go and make it public again. Just done. And I'll share my screen and show you what I did there in a second, guys. We'll give it about five seconds or so before we refresh it. And now you can see that it's public again. So this is all automated, you know, all without, you know, any significant amount of coding. This is all, you know, hitting the standard AWS API. This is a very easy thing to go and do where we've now got a button in Slack that, um, you know, the user who went and built this, if they did it wrong, right? They're going to get an alert. They can go hit that button and it's going to go and change it. Perfect. So let me uh, let me share my screen again, and then I can uh, I can show everybody the, the next step here. Just share. So yeah, I, I basically just went over here, uh, and I just made this book of public. So that's literally the exact uh, the exact uh, change. I just changed the configure configuration options to false as opposed to true. So really really simple to uh, to do that. And we've got templates for this over here as well. If you want to do that yourself. And um, the other thing that you can do then is if I click OK, uh, this is fine. Add public tags. It's gonna just go ahead here, trigger, okay, we're gonna capture the tags. The reason I'm capturing the tags here is that actually, I'm, I'm not even doing it here, but I, I'd probably like to append. So I probably shouldn't overwrite all the tags and say like, hey, this is public. That's the only tag you need to care about. If somebody else has tags, I probably need to append them. And then I'm just changing the tags to have like public true. Uh, and now that, uh, yeah, that S3 bucket has been marked as public and now we actually don't need to worry about it. And the next time, the next time that uh, like our checks run, in Lacework, this isn't actually going to flag because the policy has already said that if anything is true, you don't need to, or if anything is flagged as public, you don't need to worry about it. So this is an example of, I suppose, like when we're talking about like that automated remediation from reckless to fearless, this is the sort of thing that you can do. But if we're honest, this is still very reckless. Like this is not how you should be automating your security response. Um, I'd love to say like, yeah, just, you know, contact the user on Slack and then just click a button and then like, yeah, make that, you know, private or make that public or add a tag. You should probably be tracking some information. So our next example is going to be a little bit more, it's still not going to be a hundred percent exactly what we'd expect you to do in production, but it's going to be a little bit more realistic in, you know, what you might, uh, what you might want to do. Um, so we'll pull this one up here. This is an anomaly event. So Ron, do you want to talk about what an anomaly event might look like in, uh, in Lacework? Yeah, so so as I was explaining before, when I talked a, kind of a little bit and gave everybody kind of a high level overview of, of Lacework, we, we we sort of create you know uh, what I would consider kind of two two buckets of alerts or two buckets of events inside of Lacework. The first is you know known bads, like we know this to be bad. So for example, the compliance violation that you just saw, right? Uh, S three buckets should not be all public uh, unless we meant to do that, and we should be uh, tagging or documented in some way. Um, you know, you shouldn't allow all traffic to hit port twenty two on all your boxes, and so on and so forth, right? You shouldn't have critical vulnerabilities, things like that. These are all sort of normal things that we track inside of Lacework. We produce events on, and you can go and automate on on top of times with that. The second bucket of, uh, of data that we provide is, is um, the unknown bats. Uh, and so this is really the kind of hard thing in security that we spent all that time uh, figuring out, which is, you know, how do, we, how do we learn what an environment actually looks like? And so this is not us going and saying, 
you know, uh, from threat feeds and, 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 and rules or policies like, hey, I think these things are usually bad when these happen, right? If somebody attempts to log into a box 100 times, that's probably bad, right? I'm not going and setting any of those policies. I'm learning your environment and how your environment works from start to finish. And when it deviates, I'm saying like, hey, this is interesting. There's some security context, right? This is a new process that we've seen connecting to this box. Um, and it tried a whole bunch of logins or you know, it kicked off a whole bunch of daughter processes that we haven't seen before. Um, somebody should really go and look at this. And so these are what we call anomaly events. Um, and so this is another great you know, set of automations that you can go and create on top of that in times where you go and receive those lacework events. And if they're anomalies, you wanna take a different workflow than if they're known bats. Perfect. So a couple of good examples, just I've highlighted them here. So like examples of anomaly events that'll fire reasonably frequently. Uh, well, hopefully not too frequently as like Lacework learns your environment, but like a new user is logged into a device for the very first time, or an assumed role is being used in AWS for the first time, or an external connection has been made to a new host, or uh, and this should have the word location at the very end of it, but a user is logged in from a new and unusual location. So maybe a user is logged into your AWS instance from like Egypt, but they're normally based in the United States. All of those sort of things are things that, to be honest, like a new user logs into a device, that has to happen the very first time somebody logs into a device. Same with, you know, an assumed role being used or a user logging in from a new location, maybe they're on holidays. However, these are things that you still want to investigate and you still want to potentially take some action on. And especially if these are like malicious, you want to take some action on. But compared to the last example where, you know, we just contacted the user on Slack and made a book of private, here we're going to take a few more actions just to make it that little bit more realistic. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to kick off this second uh, second alert here. Uh, so I've received this second alert and instantly have actually just like uh, foiled my demo. So I've deduplicated that alert, uh, which is exactly what should happen. You don't want this alert to fire for the second time, but I obviously did a run through this afternoon. So uh, I'm going to delete that and fire it again. Uh, let's fire this again. One second. Brilliant. So the very first thing I've done is I've received this alert, which is perfect, and or received this event. Let's take a look at it. So this is a new user. Uh, and this one is, it doesn't require too much investigation. So the user hacked was seen for the first time on our host, uh, jump.aws.mrjoshuap.com. Definitely malicious, but still there's a whole lot of things that we can do. Uh, we can see the event happened uh, on the 7th of September. Uh, kind of interesting. That's something that we can note later on. And the event source is like Lacework Agent, which is cool. So if we're building a little bit more of a realistic, I suppose, uh, yeah, story and times. The first thing that we want to do is we want to have different alerts or different, uh, sorry, different like workflows or different, we call them automation stories based on whether this is an anomaly alert or based on whether this is a compliance alert or based on even the different types of those like events that are, uh, that are coming in. So here I'm just triggering if this is an anomaly. That's actually that it's been created by the Lacework agent. Uh, and then I'm going to like build this like workflow down here. However, if I want it, I can drag this on. Actually, I can even just clone this over here, uh, clone this here, and then I would say trigger if compliance. And now I could build a totally separate flow for compliance uh, and just change this to compliance. I know that that's correct. And now you'd have a separate flow for your compliance alerts and things like that. So it's pretty easy to do that, but that's definitely something you do. You don't want everything following the exact same path. You want quite a few things following the same path. Keep it as generic as possible, but Let's be realistic. You don't want uh, you know, the same workflow uh, in every single case. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to deduplicate events. So that like for the demo a little bit, uh, but deduplicating events basically just says, hey, here, based on, I'm just doing it against two paths. So based on the event title and the event description here, this is just the, I suppose, the JSON path that I've received. So this is receive lacework events dot body dot event title and event description. So I'm saying if this exact same event with the exact same title has been received twice in the same, and I'll go here, 86,400 seconds, so day, then ignore it. Like, I don't want to see it. Just like suppress it. And you can change this to an hour. You can change this to a minute. You can change this to like the last 1,000 events if you uh, change it. But it's just a useful way of saying like, hey, actually, you know, if I've seen something once, I, I don't want to see it again. I don't want 10, 10 tickets created. But that's something that you will probably do, and you will do in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, the next thing I'm doing then is the same action that I took. So uh, in the previous one, so get event by ID in Lacework. So here we can see Lacework is actually giving us a few more events. Actually, let's let's view uh, let's view this event in uh, in Lacework again. Here. 
that when I view this event in Lacework, we can see some more information. So I can see, let's load it up. So this is 91144. This is severity medium. So the user hacked was seen for the first time. Uh, there's two users for each and hacked, uh, the application bash. But this is the sort of information that's actually like really cool that can help me investigate this. So the first thing, I've got the file hashes. They could be interesting because they could be malicious. I've got the command lines. Uh, so I can actually see if I copy those command lines that this person's making a curl command. Uh, and if I paste it up here, they're downloading uh, a file from dasmalwerk.com. Uh, that's bad, presumably. Uh, I don't particularly want to uh, investigate that. Uh, they're also running like minus bash and sudo minus u hacked minus i. Uh, and then, yeah, you can see the other, like they're on curl bash and sudo, that's fine. But there's some other information that I want. So if I look at, sorry, let's look at this information that's come in from Lacework when I get this event. So Lacework, again, the API is like really powerful. So it's actually pulled in all of this information in the entity map. So I can see the machine and usefully I can see this instance ID. That'll be important later. I can see the external IP. I can see the file paths along with those hashes. So I can investigate those if I want. I can see the applications. Uh, so bash and sudo. I can see the processes along with those command lines in case I want to investigate those. And I can see the user. So I can see it was root and hacked that logged in on that, logged in to this machine that were the new users. So really, really interesting information here. However, there's still more information I, I might want. So you can think like, like maybe you're like, hey, actually I want to see, have we seen this user before? And all my logs are stored in like Snowflake. So if you want, you could just go here, search like our public templates for Snowflake, run a Snowflake query. And all you do here is you'd, you know, change your query to say like, hey, get me all results for that particular user. So select star from, and then you'd pass through that user ID. So Tynes will actually auto-complete this information as well. So if I connect this up, uh, you can see Tynes will like help you build your query. So you've got like, you know, receive lacework events dot body dot, and it will like help you pick the, pick the data that you want from the previous actions. But you could run a Snowflake query. You could search your CMDB for that instance and say, like, hey, is there any more information about that? You could potentially, like, you know, search Jira and say, like, hey, do we have any other tickets open for this uh, open for this particular user? Like, search issues in Jira. Uh, you could, like, contact the, like, yeah, I suppose contact your engineering team as well. You could send an email. All that sort of stuff you can really easily do. What I'm doing here is I'm just taking a really simple, making a simple API call to the EC2 API. I'm just going to describe instances and pass through that instance ID. So what that's gonna do is that's gonna tell me more information about that, like uh, about this instance. And if I look at this, you can see here, I've got some really cool information. So I've got here, sorry, it's like nested pretty deeply. I've got the instance ID here. I've got the instance state. So this is running. I've got the private DNS name. I've got the key name, I've got, the yeah, public IP. I've also got things like, you know, the platform details. I've got my yeah, architecture, all that sort of stuff. Any like a lot of cool information that I might want. I think there's some more information. Yeah, your tag set, for example, here. So I can see that this is like owned by Mr. Joshua P and the name is jump uh, AWS on Mr. Joshua app.com, et cetera. Um, but all of this information I've got uh, like through through AWS, and this can inform my decision on what I want to do, uh, if it's good or bad. Now, obviously hacked probably bad, but Still, really, really easy to, and yeah, even like the instance site T2 micro. What's cool about Tynes then is like, I can, yeah, like I can record all this information. So all of the information from these events is available to me in the next action. So my next action here is I'm gonna create an issue in Jira. So again, I'm just gonna use one of those templates that I have over here uh, to create that issue in Jira, but you don't really need to rely on those templates if you've got a curl command or something. But here, what I've done is I've just, I created a task with the priority medium in the project demo. I passed through a description. Now, I've passed through quite a bit of information, but if I look at my ticket here, show demo 7172. Let's go for demo 7172. I've got- this is, this is incredibly powerful what you're doing here. You're you're creating a ticket, not only from the data that Lacework has generated here yeah. to create the alert, but you're also adding the data from AWS based on the instance that you got from the Lacework alert. So you're saying, okay, the Lacework data is useful. We want to add the AWS data. Now there's nothing stopping you from going and adding 10, 15, 20 more data sources if you want into this ticket so that everything exists in one place. 
Absolutely. And that's like, and we don't, so charge, we, at times we charge based on stories and like you, we've got to, we'll tell you about that later. We've got a community edition that's free. So you can actually run this as like uh, for free and you can build out a really, really powerful story. But like, yeah, you can imagine the things that you might do in this circumstances. You might actually investigate those hashes in virus total and include this information here. You might investigate that IP address in gray noise and abuse IPDB on two or three other tools, your threat Intel tool, or you might say like, you might, yeah, look up your asset registry to see like, hey, actually, like, or what, what device is this IP address supposed to be associated with, et cetera. But here in Lace or here in Jira, you can see, we've just got like, we've got some really cool information here. New Lacework alert, alert title, new user, description, hack seen for the first time. I've got all of that information in a really nice table so that I can actually just record what's happened. I then sent this information to Slack. So I'm doing the same thing again. Uh, so let me just go back here. Uh, I'm doing the same thing when I'm posting an alert uh, in Slack. So I'm just hitting the Slack API. I could just as easily be using Teams here. I could just as easily be using like any other platform that you want here. Yeah, we're, we're using Slack, but you can see here, I've got all this information here. So I've got new Lacework alert, uh, like description hack scene for the first time, event type new user. Uh, I can view the event in Lacework. I should probably actually have included the Jira ticket ID here. So somebody could have just like clicked and gone straight to the Jira ticket and seen the comments. Uh, so I'll know that for next time. I've got my machine, I've got my instance state, uh, my tags, my instance ID here as well. And yeah, then I've got two options here. So my two options are, this is known activity and stop instance. You can add in as many options as you want, by the way, but here's the two, uh, the two options. So the reason that like I've recorded this ticket in Jira as well is that I wanna be able to like have a record of what's happened afterwards. So I, I'm gonna click, this is known activity. I like, Presumably this isn't what you do, but let's just uh, let's just take a look. This is known activity. So what I've done here is this is said this is okay. It's actually responded to this Slack channel saying thanks for responding. I've then updated my Jira ticket. So if I go to my Jira ticket, I've got here this is legit. User is confirmed in Slack that they recognize this activity. If I want, I can like go through the whole process of identifying this user and stuff like that. You can have like interactive responses. I can talk about those later if we want. Uh, and then I said this ticket will be closed automatically. And then what's even cooler is then like, I've just closed the ticket. So I've actually just made a transition and I've marked the ticket as done. So now this is an alert that's been created. And like from start to finish, like the security team didn't have to have any involvement with it. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's closed. Now in reality, again, user hacked, probably don't want to do that. You probably want to have this in progress. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to like, yeah, we're going to stop this EC2 instance and we're going to check, uh, check it. So here I'm going to click stop instance. Let's go. Uh, that's going to just like record that alert or record that response in Slack or sorry, in Tynes. Tynes is going to receive that. And then we're going to make a command to stop that instance. So again, just the stop instance command. And then I'm going to send an alert to the Slack channel. Let's go here. So an EC2 instance has been stopped based on Lacework alert 91144. Instance state stopping, instance IP2 micro. And then there's your, uh, there's your instance ID. And then I've updated my Jira ticket. And my Jira ticket has said, hey, an EC2 instance has been stopped based on Lacework alert 91144. So like really, really powerful to like to take those actions. And if we, I think if I go back in here and take a look at the event, hopefully we'll see. Yes, yeah, so that worked. Nope, that wasn't what I was doing. Hold on a second, show. EC2, oh yeah, sorry, here we go. Stop instance, stop instances, instance set item. So current state stopping previous state running. So this has actually gone in, it's changed it from running to stopping. And if I check this again, now the instance will be stopped. So we've actually pared that down. Now you could do a whole load of other things here. You could say, hey, like take a snapshot of this before shutting it down or things like that. But it's just really easy to show you, I suppose, um, what you can do. Um, there's a few more things that I wanted to say. Like this is still a little bit like reckless. So I want to show you one or two of the other things that you can do just to, like really build. And then we can, as so I was talk about some really advanced scenarios. Uh, but yeah, a good example here that you might want to do. This is just to show you the, how easy it is to build in times and like take those next actions. If you have just like, you know, stopped a, an EC2 instance, you probably shouldn't just record it in a Jira ticket and then just sell, tell your team like, hey, you should have should have been like tracking that Jira ticket. You probably should, you know, alert somebody in PagerDuty or Opsgenie or something like that. If I wanted to do that, I'll show you how easy it is. I'm just going to search over here for PagerDuty. There's public templates here, create an incident in PagerDuty. I've created a private template uh, that has just my name and uh, a, an ID associated with it already. But here you can see I've got a really nice template. 
like the server's on fire, a disk is getting full. I'm going to say, actually, no, maybe I'll uh, do a tiny little bit different. I'll say uh, an inst EC2 instance has been stopped. An EC2 instance has been stopped. I just copied the text that I sent in my Slack channel or, and said an EC2 instance has been stopped based on Lacework alert. And actually, let me go here. Uh, let me pull all of that in. Here you go, an EC2 instance has been stopped based on Lacework alert here. And now the next time this runs, let's go here, try run. This is going to send an alert to PagerDuty. And now if I've done this to my engineering team, uh, they will get alerted. Hopefully they're aware that I'm on my uh, I'm on a webinar. But there you go. Hey, Thomas, six instances has been assigned to you. An instance has been stopped. An EC2 instance has been stopped based on Lacework alert 91144 incredibly powerful like to just do that really quickly i don't know like the question that normally gets asked is yeah but what about like you know ops genie or something like that i've shown you a lot of examples using these like pre-built templates for ops genie or for any other tool if you've got a curl command i'll show you how easy it is so here's ops genie just going to click copy that curl command let's go to times press paste and now you've got the formatting for that alert to ops genie there you go ops genie v2 alerts it's going to be a bit of a pain in fairness to figure out all this information, but like the, the templates all there, it's not, yeah, it's not gonna to be too hard. You'll say like, Hey, I know what my engineering team is. This is who it's visible to. And then you just enter your genie key and you're good. So it's really, really powerful to do all of that. But if you want to, yeah, we can show you a whole lot of examples of the other things that you might want to do, but realistically integrating and like building in times is going to be very, very easy. And then like, yeah, just make sure, make sure that you've got those good alerts from Lacework coming in. Um, yeah, I suppose Ryan. Any uh, what other actions might you want to take, or any other thoughts based on uh, based on this? Yeah, so I have tons of thoughts on this, and and there's look, there's a lot of different actions that you might go and take. There's a lot of different events that Lacework generates, but the thing that I think is is kind of the right place to start with this, and where where you can get the most power uh, the quickest, right, and actually make a massive impact is. Uh, in the, the first example that we showed, right? So we showed a reckless way of doing this. You should obviously do it the correct way by tracking the issue in Jira, alerting on call, all that other, all that other stuff you should do. Um, but, you know, I, I, I can't tell you, you know, how many of our customers have uh, compliance reports where, you know, security is invested in compliance uh, and, you know, assets fall in or out of compliance and they go and, you know, they're bothering people in engineering or ops to go and fix this. Uh, but the feedback loop just kind of isn't there to get it done fast enough. And so they kind of have just kind of a growing estate of uh, compliance violations inside of Lacework. Um, the power of this is, you know, if you go and build these automations for, you know, the different types of compliance violations, whether it's, you know, an S3 bucket that's public or a, uh, an EBS volume that's accessible from anywhere or, or you know, a port 22 open on all your uh, on all your security groups, so on and so forth. If you go out and build all these automations so that your engineering or your ops team uh, can get alerted immediately when that happens uh, and have a couple of very quick canned default actions that they can take in order to go and fix this stuff. Um, you know, that's how we can see, or you know, that's how our customers get to the right estate where they've got, uh, you know, no compliance violations on a regular basis. And when things are happening, they're getting fixed immediately um, and really kind of cut the, 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 the mean time to, to resolution down, you know, from uh, potentially weeks down to zero. Absolutely. Like it's the, we, it's kind of a, like a principle in times, but the security team should be making it as easy as possible for other teams to do the right thing. Too often we just, you know, you know create 20 tier tickets or worse, send like 500 emails and are like, Hey, there's your problem. You can't say we didn't tell you about it using times. We can like track them, deduplicate them, create like a, give recommendations, make them as high fidelity as possible, and then make it really, really easy to remediate. So that when, yeah, when we're actually having those conversations, we're viewed as partners rather than just people that are causing more work and really kind of noisy work that nobody really wants to do. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great example. Um, and, and, you know, that's the outcome that we really wanted to as security teams. We've got, you know, I've, I've got an example of a, a customer of, of, of both of ours that, you know, just, just with vulnerability data was able to find that by, you know, by deduplicating vulnerabilities and actually looking at the lace work data and going, okay, we only care about our golden images because everything else is, is, is drift and it's just been out there for a long time. Um, you know, instead of having three, four, five thousand vulnerabilities in this fleet, there's really only about 22 things to go and fix. We go and fix those things and it propagates throughout the fleet. We're done. Um, and so that that enabled, you know, our, our, our customer and security to go get, you know, engineering and ops buy and actually go and address this stuff. That's a really big challenge that we see for, 
for large scale engineering team or large scale security and engineering teams is when the problem statement gets big, you know, you can't stop the roadmap in order to go and fix this. Exactly. Okay, I think that was uh, like for me anyway. That's pretty much what I, everything I wanted to sh show folks. Do we have any questions on the from folks on the line? Okay, well we can stick around. I, I don't. Well, actually, let me just pull up the Q and A. Uh, make sure if there are any. I'm comments. watching. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I don't see any. And um, we'll stay on the line for a couple of minutes afterwards, anyway. Uh, just so that, yeah, if anybody has any questions, they can ask us. We can turn off the recording if they, uh, or we can delete it from the recording so that it's not not going to be made. Uh, not going to be made public. Before people uh, start start dropping, there's one one last thing that I'd really like to call out, which is, you know. Uh, Tynes has a has a, uh, a a free community edition here where you can run a, a few stories. Um, Tom, Thomas, I don't actually remember how many for free. Three um, stories for free, yeah. Three stories for free, and 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 really, what I'm excited about here, and 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 uh, and what I think our you know all of our lacework customers should should go and get excited about is the two stories that we've built today are going to be available for you uh, in order to go and tweak and actually build out. Um, but that's less than three stories. They're completely free if you want to go and get started on this stuff. Um, and see the power of this, kind of start handing the keys to the environment uh, uh, from security automation back to your engineering teams and, and, and see how this goes. Yep. So de definitely, thanks, Ryan, for highlighting that. So yeah, we've got a free community edition. Go to times.com. You can get started in literally 20 seconds. Uh, and yeah, or if you want to arrange a demo with somebody on the team, go to times.com. And we've got a bunch of previous webinars on times.com slash webinars. Similarly, I know, Ryan, there's uh, a ton of folks that are super experienced that would love to, I suppose, love to learn more in Lacework, about Lacework. Yeah, and and uh, please reach out to your your Lacework contacts. Absolutely, we'd be happy to uh, to get in touch with you all. Um, we're, we're available at uh, lacework.com slash contact. We've got resources as well. Um, there's two two great questions here. Yeah, one thing that we didn't touch on is is you know what is supported, what isn't supported by this. Uh, I'm going to make some blanket statements because it's really hard to get super specific. Um, but Lacework is a is a a, a multi cloud supported solution, so we uh, deploy to our customers uh, infrastructure, whether it's in AWS, Azure, or GCP. We also deploy to on prem environments. Um, you know, if if you're running Linux or you can deploy an agent, we can certainly uh, provide the the sort of workload detections that we do, uh, basically no matter where it's deployed. And then, you know, uh, Thomas from, from Tynes' side, you know, from what I understand is it, as long as there's an API, um, you guys can build automations. Yeah, pretty much. So like uh, I show that example of like curl, like in Tynes, we don't rely on any pre-built integrations. If you've got like a curl command, if you can hit that endpoint, you're going to be able to do it in Tynes. Tynes can be cloud or on-prem. So even if you're like in your on-prem environment, we, you can either host Tynes on-prem or we've even got a connector that allows you to... Uh, Allows you to, uh, yeah, like you know, hit you hit your hit your devices that within are within your uh, within your own network, um. So yeah, really really easy. But yeah, anything that has an API, we're going to be able to able to hit. Fantastic. Um, Science so platform has uh, about a a dozen or so uh, native built integrations into different lacework types of events, different types of uh, API calls. Um, so basically, if the if the data exists either in the lacework UI or the lacework API, um, Times already has a pre built integration to go and do that. On the lacework side, um, we you would open what's called a uh, an alert channel. To send the data to Tynes, uh, your your if you're a Lacework customer, your CSM would be more than happy to talk you through this, uh, as well as there's there's support documentation on the website. Um, but additionally, you know if you if you want to put the Lacework data into you know S3 or Snowflake, Tynes can also go and hit those places and and, and get uh, you know do more attributions as as uh, Thomas was mentioning earlier. Maybe you want to go, you know, hey, new user scene. Maybe you want to go. Uh, and uh, and query that user in you know with an SQL query across your entire Snowflake data set to see you know yeah maybe it's the first time they've been seen on this box but they've been seen on forty other boxes so it's not really a new user uh, and kind of go and and add that additional data set. Yep. Um, another question there. So how does time the Times platform integrate with Lacework? So yeah, I suppose. I think Brian, you hit the hit that there. Basically, like, yeah, you can create 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 a, a webhook, create an alert channel, and then send that directly to this webhook in Tynes. And similarly, then you can see here we've got a credential for Lacework here. This is actually like a, a credential that we fetch periodically using what we call the HTTP request action credential. So we just pull Lacework, fetch a new credential, and then um, 
yeah, we're able to use that to, uh, I suppose, to run these, uh, like these bear, I suppose, bear commands. But yeah, run these API, run, run, run these API calls uh, really, really easily. It's, it's, it's very, very easy to set up. Um, the last, last yeah, question is whether Tynes has a two-way Jira integration. Yeah, so 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 as Tynes doesn't really rely on like pre-built integrations as such. So like Tynes can connect to Jira using the Jira API, and Jira can send everything back to Tynes using the Jira webhooks or using webhooks in Jira. So it's really really simple to set up both. And um, but it's not like a hey, these are the like the ten things that you can do. It's anything that you can do in Jira, you're going to be able to do in Tynes, and anything that like any on any update on any comment on any whatever way you specify it using JQL from Jira, you're going to be able to send that information to Tynes, and Tynes can uh, yeah like process that. So we'll have a lot of people that will like. Uh, there's some really nice examples of like uh, here, you know, somebody will like mark an alert as closed or mark uh, in Jira, and then we can go out and validate that and be like, hey, actually, yeah, that didn't, uh, you didn't actually close that. You just marked the alert as closed, reopen, uh, and things like that. So there's there's really nice things that you can do there if you want. Um, I hope that answers hope that answers that question. Great. I think I think that's all the questions that we've gotten at least so far. We're uh... I think we already stopped the recording, if I understand correctly. Um, so we'll hang out for a few more minutes, but I just wanted to at least take a moment to thank everybody for joining us here. We're super excited on the Lacework side about this partnership and all the things that you can go and do with Tynes and, and uh, you know, not only the technology, but the team over there is phenomenal. So it's it's been great getting to know them more over the last six months or so. Absolutely, yeah, and, and vice versa. We've been, uh, yeah, delighted that we got a bunch of happy customers that are using Lacework that speak really highly of it and that we're, yeah, we're able to, I suppose, generate stories quickly with uh, with yeah, decent APIs, decent folks. So it's been a pleasure.